So <laughs> I'm having fun. That's true. But but there really is a point behind all that. I'm I'm I am kind of new to this YouTube stuff, especially producing. And I would at some point really like to be quite good at it. So what I'm doing is I'm I'm actually kind of challenging myself to rather than just record me talking about stuff and then put it out there, I actually want to learn how to get good at doing that stuff. So um, there's a purpose behind this stupidity. But I want to do a training camp uh, video. And because I'm about three camps behind, rather than going through three camps, while I have a little bit of time, I want to just do kind of a roundup. Um, kind of just going back all the way and going position by position because that's just how my brain works. I'm very systematic and I'm sorry if you're hearing that buzzing. I'm using my phone to record and I just am getting a billion notifications for some reason. So probably Twitter stuff because that's a little crazy. But um, that's the goal for today. So we'll start at quarterback. We'll work our way through. And I'm, I guess I'll just give my thoughts on where we're at with it. And that's it. So quarterback is pretty simple. Aaron Rodgers looks like Aaron Rodgers. There have been quite a few reports about errant passes and interceptions, but that's really not new. That's actually pretty common for training camp. I remember, I, I want to say about two years ago, there were tons of interceptions and people were starting to panic. I think Aaron Rodgers is just kind of, this is his time to really work through some stuff and really kind of challenge, you know, throw balls that he probably isn't going to throw in the regular season. So I'm not worried about Aaron Rodgers. We'll see where he's at when the regular season starts and how all that comes together. Tim Boyle has been absolutely tearing it up. Um, it doesn't mean a lot in the grand scheme of things, but what it does mean, which I would not have necessarily expected, uh, what it does mean, I believe, is that week one and, and more than likely throughout the rest of the season, if anything were to happen to Aaron Rodgers, Tim Boyle would probably be the guy to step in. So um, kudos to him. He got a chip on his shoulder when he heard about Jordan Love. He said, I'm not I'm not going out without a fight, and he came out swinging. Turns out he didn't really need to swing all that hard because Jordan Love is is really taking a while, and it's it's normal. I'm not trying to rip on the guy. Um, he hasn't had a lot of opportunities to come in and learn the system. I mean, just basic stuff like footwork is is it's it's all choreography. If my phone does not stop buzzing, I'm gonna flip out. Okay, um, so he's he's got a ways to go, which is fine. That's what we expected when we drafted him. That's why I said the best team he could possibly go to is the Green Bay Packers. Because not only are you learning behind Aaron Rodgers, but you're going to a place where you don't need to start right away. And everybody knew he needs time to develop. He's going to have the time to develop. He's going to learn from one of the greatest in the game. Matt LaFleur is a quarterback guy. It's a quarterback-friendly system. I mean, it's just the absolute perfect scenario. But it's going to take time, and that's fine because we have time. So not actually a whole lot going on with quarterbacks. No bad news, which is good. Um, I'm not even going to say the I word. Everybody's healthy, and uh, that's pretty much it. So running back is actually kind of interesting. Aaron, so, all right. The, the thought process was, and still is, A.J. Dillon is the direction Matt LaFleur wants to go. Same as uh, Jordan Love to an extent. But unlike Jordan Love, he would like to get there as soon as possible. I don't know exactly where we're at with that because I think the, the long-term vision, if Matt LaFleur could snap his fingers and just make something happen, would be A.J. Dillon is the workhorse back. Aaron Jones, I'm blanking on everybody's name, is sort of the Austin Eckler. He's a great running back. He's also the really good receiving back. So there's that sort of dual dynamic, but the, the main workload is on Aaron or A.J. Dillon. The question I have is, is he ready? There was some talk about there being concerns with him in pass protection. Number one rule, if you can't protect Aaron Rodgers, you don't play. It's that simple. Now, you could say, well, he doesn't have to go out there and pass block. He can just run. That's a risky game, and they're, they're going to put him out one way or another. So there will be a little bit of that and, and some trial by fire, but there's no way in the world they're going to tip their hand by putting him out there and declaring 100% we're going to run. So that's a big part of his de development on top of everything else in terms of how well he's getting it. And I don't know the answer to that question necessarily in terms of how far along he is. There's great reports about him making good cuts and looking agile and his legs and all this random stuff. But I don't know where we're at with that. But I do think that's the long-term vision. Um, in the meantime, it's it's sort of the same 
dynamic with Jamal and Aaron Jones. Now, the good thing is it doesn't matter because we have a phenomenal group of running backs. There's also Dexter Williams, who I personally like a lot, but there's something about Dexter that, that he wasn't quite where um, the coaching staff wanted him to be, Matt LaFleur wanted him to be, because he didn't play, right? He looked great when he was out there, but he wasn't. And that happens on occasion, guys who look really good, but they just don't get any playing time. And you're like, why is that? Because there's very specific things you're supposed to do, and if you don't do it, then you don't know what you're doing, and you're a liability, and we're not going to let you play. So I hope Dexter can get get it figured out and be a part of this rotation. But the bottom line is we've got some really good running backs with a ton of sky-high potential, and at worst-case scenario, we have Aaron Jones ripping everybody's face off. Best-case scenario, uh, we have a dynamic that is Derrick Henry 2.0 and Aaron Jones. So I think, I think we're good. So wide receiver, I've got it broken down thusly Devonte is Devonte. he's the elite number one no questions asked i genuinely believe alan lazard has cemented the number two spot I, people will disagree with me a lot of people really like mvs and he does provide a different dynamic and there's no question that matt lafleur wants that kind of a guy out there situationally but i genuinely believe alan lazard has kind of cemented that i mean he just there's just that feel which has continued from the regular season into training camp that Alan Lazard is just on another level. Then below that, you've got EQ and MVS are the two guys that I'm looking at. Um, haven't heard a lot recently about Equinemius, but he, he really got off to a great start. You can tell by the tone of the coaching staff, they really like what he brings and want to see what he can do. And, and I think before he got injured, he was doing some really great stuff for the team. I, I, I really thought he was um, one of the better wide receivers we had. Not that that's saying much before he got hurt. But I, I kind of feel like they're on the next tier. Now, the question of are they competing for the number three spot, I'm not entirely sure. And the reason I say that is because if they decide to use Equinemius as a big slot, which is what I have been saying that they should do for a while, but they haven't seemed to necessarily want to do that, um, then they're kind of just two separate positions, which would mean, similar to corner, but we'll get there, you've got Devontae and you've got Devontae and Alan Lazard and MVS, and then you've got EQ in the slot. So when we go three wide, you've got one, two, and EQ, which doesn't necessarily mean MVS is below EQ. It just means that MVS is number three on the boundary and EQ is number one in the slot. They're on different, they're, they're in different areas, right? Um, after that, it's a whole lot of just kind of, I don't know. Um, a lot of people really like Reggie Begleton. I'm not super high on, on his ability, not because of anything he's done wrong, I just think fans get too excited about how elite he was in the Canadian Football League without recognizing how little that means anything at all. It, it literally means nothing. Uh, the Canadian Football League is made up of people who couldn't even get into the NFL, right? So you got the NFL, you got college football players, and then you've got bad college football players, and then you have practice squad college uh, practice squad football players, and then somewhere down here you've got. Canadian Football League. So he was dominant in, in that. It's kind of like dominant practice squad guys or something, right? Um, doesn't mean he can't make the team. Doesn't mean he can't come in and have a big impact. But I just think that there's a huge gap between fans' expectations because he's tearing up the CFL and and what his ceiling is. Um, I think Darius Shepard is interesting because not only has he had a nice camp that he's kind of put together or you know decent enough but you've also got the dynamic of him what he brings on special teams and there's also the question of how many guys are there um malik taylor is another option uh he's kind of one of those guys that you know once a game twice a game twice a practice i should say he's he's got a little note here and there he's kind of bottom on my list though in terms of potential and then finally you got jay kumaro which i know is a big fan favorite I, I don't know. It, it kind of depends what, what the Packers think of the guys that they have, but I feel like they're not going to be utilizing as much three wide receiver. We already heard Aaron Rodgers talk about we're probably going to be using more 12 personnel. 12 personnel is one running back, two tight ends, two wide receivers. Also 22 personnel. Other personnel that have two wide receivers and not three, meaning the the benefit of having a third wide receiver is reduced. The benefit of having a fourth wide receiver is much more reduced than a fifth wide receiver. So by the time you get down to what should we do with Jay Kumaro, it's, it just it kind of doesn't matter, right? There, in other words, we can take a little bit more of a risk. We know at the very least with Kumaro, we've got a guy that we can count on to, to X degree. But if, we, if we've got Devontae and Lazard, who are going to make up the vast majority of snaps, and we got MVS, who's going to come out you know, when, in, in certain situations who we really like, and we got Equinemius, who's going to be in the slot, as well as outside occasionally, who we like, 
we're pretty good with with the four guys we've got. Now it's just kind of a matter of do we want to bring in Kumaro to kind of just be what he's always been, or do we want to really take a shot with Shepard, who provides the return ability, with Begleton and his size and upside, with Malik Taylor and whatever it is we like about Malik Taylor. Um, I feel like they're going to roll the dice. I, I genuinely don't think Kumaro makes it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he does, but I just I feel like with his age and everything else, we kind of know what we get with him, and I, I think it would be better off to see what other people bring to the position. So tight end, I'm actually really excited about, probably more than I should be and more than most Packer fans, which I'm usually on the other side of that. But um, I really like the guys that we have. I, I, I Every year, the Packers give us a reason to be excited, and then we get let down. This is the one year I feel like we don't have a reason to be excited, and I really want to be excited. Not only did I really like Jace in college, he was my second favorite guy um, in college that year, more so than Noah Fant. Just really like Jace Sternberger and his route running and all that kind of stuff. We'll see. I'm actually, he's my second favorite on the team right now because I, I feel like he has a bit to learn, although he has a really high ceiling. I, I, I just kind of feel like... He's got a lot of catching up to do. He only played like one year at Texas A&M. He comes here, he gets hurt, so he's not even had a full year as an NFL player. So he's got one year of college under his belt. It's just kind of iffy. But I'm excited about his upside and what he can do, you know, kind of filling that Jimmy Graham role where about 50% of the time he's in the slot, blah, blah, blah. The guy I'm really excited about is Josiah DeGuara, and I feel like I'm the only person on the planet that's really excited about him. But I just feel like he's the piece that Matt LaFleur loves. And whatever Matt LaFleur loves is what I'm going to buy, right? I'm, I'm buying in on it. So that's why I like A.J. Dillon. That's why I like Josiah DeGuara because those are his kinds of guys. The way his mind works and, and working with this scheme, these are the pieces that he utilizes to break defenses. Take that for what it's worth, but let's also take into account Josiah DeGuara, unlike Jay Sternberger, played about, I think it was five years. Played five full years. I shouldn't say full, but I'm going to say that anyways. Um... At Cincinnati. So it's not a... Of course, there's a lot of catching up. The difference between Cincinnati and the Green Bay Packers is massive. But it was a very similar system. If you watch Duquara and what he did in Cincinnati and what, what Matt LaFleur is bringing to the Green Bay Packers, it's very, very similar stuff. So whatever Matt LaFleur is asking him to do sort of operationally, he gets it. He understands what he's supposed to do and why he's supposed to do it. As far as technique and all that stuff, he's got to learn how to be a, do it at a, a next level. But he understands what he's doing. So I'm, I'm super excited about it. I think Mercedes Lewis provides what Mercedes Lewis provides. Um, and Robert Tanyan is, is sort of the, um, I guess I'll say worst case scenario. We have Robert Tanyan as sort of our best receiving tight end. But I feel like we've had that before in the past where we just, um, what, Richard Rodgers? I mean, is Tanyan worse than Richard Rodgers? I feel like they're pretty similar um, in terms of what you get from them. So hopefully it's, it's, it's that upside of, Jace and DeGuara being dominant, but worst case scenario, it'll be fine. Offensive line, I don't really have a whole lot to say. A lot of people are making a lot about the uh, competition at right tackle and, and possible competition at guard, and, and there's no question there could be some shuffling around, but I, I really think it's, if anything, it's due to injury. I genuinely believe the Packers have it the way that they want it. I believe that the right tackle is, is Wagner, and I believe that the right guard is going to be Billy Turner. And the rest is, is exactly as you would expect. Um, Billy Turner has been playing right tackle in the absence of Wagner, who is injured. And uh, apparently he's been doing well. I just don't think he's going to take that job. I don't. I, I, we'll see what happens. But I, I, I think, if anything, what we've learned is that we've got decent depth. And with the versatility of a lot of the guys that we have, with Elton Jenkins being able to play anywhere along the interior, some people even think at tackle, but I don't know. Um, Billy Turner can play guard. He can play tackle. We've got a lot of guys that can do a lot of different things. Um, I think it makes you feel good about the, the chances of losing at least one guy, right? If, if you lose multiple, nobody can, can weather too much damage. But that's the biggest takeaway that I have is, is I really like it. I haven't seen a ton from the young guys. Uh, I think John Runyon maybe is the one guy that kind of stands out. Stepniak hasn't even played yet due to injury. And I think um, Jake Hansen has struggled quite a bit. Some errant snaps at center and, and some bad play, well, along with some good stuff. But um, as far as the young guys, the, the three six-round picks, I would say John Runyon, then Jake Hansen, and then the guy that hasn't even stepped foot on the field. But otherwise, I, I wouldn't expect a ton to come out of this, depending on what happens with Wagner and his injury. Um, I think we knew what the offensive line was coming in, and I think that's still the plan. The only other 
kind of news is that Alex Light seems to be the de facto backup tackle. I know I just said, uh, uh, what's his name, Billy Turner is going to be the tackle, but whenever Bakhtiari goes out, you've got Alex Light sliding in there, so that's that, and then also uh, Bakhtiari is just dominant and beats everybody, which is nice. As far as defensive line, obviously we know Kenny Clark is that uh, blue chip player, he's, and he's playing like it. He looks exactly like it. The, the question is, who's going to be the guy that steps up behind him? Uh, Montrevious is the one guy that you, you kind of feel like this is his last shot, and unfortunately he's injured right now. And I, I kind of feel like if he doesn't get back on the field, he may just get cut. That's a very distinct possibility in my mind. Dean Lowry is the de facto number two. But at the very least, we, we would really like to see, and I think the biggest hope is Kingsley Kiki for him to be able to step up. Now, it's, it's kind of a weird thing with Kingsley because he's built like a gap-shooting, penetrating, pass-rushing kind of guy. I think he's like 280 pounds or so. Um, but he's actually fairly adept as a run defender, but has, has never been a good pass rusher. And that includes his time at Texas A&M, similar situation there. Um, but that's the big hope is that he steps up. And ever, ever since, uh, Jerry Montgomery, who's the defensive line coach basically stepped up and said, we need to see more from Kingsley Kiki. He has stepped up. So that's kind of where we're at is Kingsley Kiki is the number one guy. Dean Lowry is the guy that some years he's really good. Some years he's kind of iffy. He's real up and down. We'd like to get more consistency out of it. Kingsley Kiki is the guy that at the very least, we'd like to see him try to get up to that level of Dean Lowry and hopefully possibly surpass Dean Lowry. After that, I don't have a lot of hope for a lot of guys. Um, there was one guy I left off and I'm forgetting his name. But um, Lancaster, he's still around, kind of a, a big run defending kind of guy. Uh, otherwise, Willington Pavilion has made a name for himself, but I think he's one of those kind of lower tier guys that's beaten up on, on the third stringers that you kind of hope we push up a little bit and, and see what he can do against some better competition. You know, at some point, and I'm sure he's done this several times, but at some point kind of seeing can he hang with like an Elton Jenkins or can he hang with sort of a Corey Lindsley? And uh, if so, then we can start taking it more seriously. If he's just beaten up on backup offensive guards, then I'm not quite as interested. But I think we kind of know exactly what it is. It's Kenny Clark and a bunch of guys that really need to step up and help out Kenny Clark. Um, edge rush is another position that I'm extremely excited about. The, the biggest question is who's going to be number four. We know we have Zadarius Preston and Rashawn. The issue is who's going to be behind that. Um, and it's a lot of guys that we don't know. Jonathan Garvin was a seventh round pick. A lot of people are excited about him. I believe somebody at um, uh, the draft network, or maybe just the draft network in general, had him in the top 100. So a lot of people really love his skill set. We got Trayvon Hester, Tim Williams, uh, Tipicalea, Randy Ramsey. I think Tipicalea has shown probably the most of all these guys. The problem is he's like 230 pounds. So he's a very unique skill set that is not typical of a Mike Pettin system. However, he did have Kyler Fackrell. Granted, he in inherited Kyler Fackrell, but he did have Kyler Fackrell, used Kyler Fackrell, and, and kind of got the best out of a guy like Kyler, Kyler Fackrell. So it's not impossible they go in that direction. But we've got to figure out, first of all, how many we're keeping. It's going to be at least four, obviously. But which of these guys is going to separate? It would be nice if we kept, like, five and we had a Jonathan Garvin who kind of fits the prototype. He's a draft pick. He's had a real impressive start to training camp, as well as a typical Leia who could be sort of that Kyler Fackrell situational pass rusher that you're not going to throw out there on a regular basis. But if you want to give a guy a breather on a third and uh, – you don't give a breather on a third and 15, I guess. But – I don't know, whatever, it, certain situation, a second and 15, I don't know. You put a guy like that out there, and, and you could also explore, depending on how um, versatile you want to be or how, uh, uh, I don't know, adventurous, it's a stupid word, you want to be possibly trying him out at linebacker or, you know, kind of whatever. It, it's just a thought. But the other thing that's really exciting, and I know this happened last year as well, but Rashawn Gary has looked phenomenal. I just want to, I know I said I wasn't going to do notes, but this is from one of the last camps that I didn't do anything on. Um, we didn't do a video on. These are just the notes on Rashawn Gary. Gary lightning fast around the glue two times, two easy wins. Gary with an easy win against Conway, not Conway bounced back for win in round two. Anyways, Rashawn Gary scoots around Alex Light for what would have probably been a sack on third down. Rashawn Gary with a little pressure working against Bakhtiari. That's the closest David Bakhtiari has come to allowing a pressure that I've seen. Now Gary with a sack against Billy Turner. By my count, that's three sacks Rashawn Gary would have had in team drills today if tackling the quarterback was allowed. Um, 
Rogers incomplete to Adams. Some pressure from Gary versus Bakhtiari. John Runyon Jr., this is just a quote from John Runyon, played against Rashawn Gary at Michigan and trained with him this summer. Quote, he's setting himself up for a spectacular second year. That's from one day. So this happened last. So you could say, well, this happened last year, too. He was he and Zadarius were kind of looking real dominant and we were all excited about it. And it worked out for Zadarius, but not so much for Rashawn. But again, I don't think Rashawn had that bad of a year. There's a cricket down here. I don't think he had that bad of a year. If you look at it statistically, he was he was fine. I've said this before several times, mostly on the podcast. But if you take Rashawn Gary and you extrapolate his snaps out, and his sacks and pressures over what um, Zadarius had, it would have been, I want to say, like 12 sacks and, I don't know, a bunch of pressures. So um, I'm excited. I'm excited to see what Rashawn Gary brings, and I'm excited to see what some of this depth brings. And, and I'm especially excited about not having to care so much about the depth because we've got a great group of pass rushers. Next up on the list is linebacker. Again, I'll put in the qualifier that is training camp, so it doesn't necessarily mean anything, but I am shocked at the positive reports that we're getting. I was not high on Christian Kirksey. I was not high on Kamal Martin. I've never been high on Ty Summers or Oren Burks, still not very. But it's been it's been a ton of positive news. Now, to start camp, it was all Christian Kirksey, especially in coverage, but just doing everything, the athleticism, all the positive traits we knew Christian Kirksey had, but it's a question of are we going to get the best version of him or not, and, and so far it has been. But Beyond that, ever since there was the declaration, I want to say probably about around the time the last video came out Saturday, Sunday-ish, there was a declaration by the coaching staff saying it's basically an open competition behind Christian Kirksey. We don't know who it's going to be. So Oren Burks had to perk up and say, hey, I'm not the de facto number two. Kamal Martin had to say, hey, I'm a draft pick, but this isn't necessarily my job. I could lose it. Ty Summers, whatever. He was thinking similar kind of stuff. But... Um, it's been intense, and there's been a ton of notes from guys like Ty Summers, Oren Burks, and Kamal Martin who haven't really had a ton in, a ton beforehand. But the biggest amount of notes has come from Kamal Martin. Again, similar to Rashawn Gary, this is from one day. I just want to read the amount of notes from Kamal Martin, um, who has inspired a ton of confidence recently. I think the Packers found a player in Kamal Martin. Another good day for the rookie. Kamal Martin shoots through the line and stuffs Jamal Williams behind the line. That rookie has flashed. Kamal Martin will have to prove it on Sundays, but he's been the real deal in camp. Just knifed through for a two- to three-yard loss right after a, right after stopped DeGuara on a screen. He's been all over the place. Martin avoids Dexter Williams, picks up a sack of love, forced an incompletion on the pass. Big smile when Kamal Martin asked about the knee that bothered him last season at Minnesota. Required surgery. Um... It says it's been good since around draft time. It showed on the field during practice. Uh, John Runyon, again, some notes on him. It says he played against him but doesn't necessarily remember in the Big Ten, but he's been very impressed. Quote, he's a downhill linebacker. He's going to throw his body weight into you. He's fast. He can run sideline to sideline. So there's, the, I, I guess you can call it a competition in my mind between Oren Burks and Kamal Martin. And the reason is I think Christian Kirksey, although it's not solidified in the same way that some of these other guys like, you know, David Bakhtiari or whatever might be solidified. Christian Kirksey could technically lose that job. But I do think it's Christian Kirksey, number one. And then who the number two is between Oren Burks, who was the de facto number two sort of opening up camp, right? He was kind of that guy until somebody can prove that they're better. Kamal Martin has kind of probably surpassed him, but doesn't quite know the system as well. So you got a little bit of this. Um, and I want to give Ty Summers credit, but I, I don't really think he's on that same tier. I think he's sort of Oren Burks light. But um, definitely a lot of athleticism, and I shouldn't count him out. He's on the team for a reason. If, if, if the Packers didn't think he had anything to offer, he wouldn't be there. And he has been putting some stuff together, um, especially in terms of his physicality, which is not exactly what he's known for. So I'm, I'm excited to see what comes of it, but at the very least, I'm just glad that there's good news because, again, I wasn't super high on anybody that we had going into uh, training camp. Cornerback, I kind of feel like I, – I, I don't want to say I got it pegged, but it just it feels – it feels right to me. So we've got Jair and Kevin King and Shannon Sullivan. Those are your three. We've got Josh Jackson, who's done a phenomenal job. He's been actually one of the better corners throughout all of camp. And although it's possible he rises up to the starting roster, I still think they're trying to get him solidified and really get him to understand the boundary. And I think they're a little concerned about his man-to-man uh, skills and not being too grabby, blah, blah, blah. But I think he's a real solid number four and a real solid um, basically number three boundary guy, the the next in line for the boundary. So if Kevin King goes out, Josh Jackson goes in for Kevin King. The only real competition would be after those four. 
and it depends how many we're keeping. But I kind of feel like Stanford Samuels has really stepped into that spot. I know Kadar Holman, a lot of people really liked him. I was never a, a huge Kadar Holman fan, didn't have real high expectations. I like Stanford Samuel, um, Stanford Samuels, and um, I just feel like he's stood out more. I think he's done more. Maybe they go with Kadar because of his experience, because he understands things, because he was drafted. I, I don't know, but I believe it's Jair, Kevin King, Chandon, Josh Jackson, Stanford Samuels. That's five. If they go six, fine, Kadar. Otherwise, those those are my five right now. And finally, safety, and I am going to end it with safety because, okay, fine. Uh, Hunter Bradley messed up a snap. J.K. Scott looks great. Cos Crosby looks great. So safety is, is more or less pegged at this point we've got adrian amos we've got darnell savage and we got raven green i think the number four guy is vernon scott we'll see if they keep five i think will redmond keeps his job and i think he stays where he is and that's your five but i think if there's four i think vernon scott takes that spot from will redmond that's my projection i don't know that it's the case I, I'm, I'm sure again it, it's it's one of those things where you feel comfortable enough about the guys that you have that you're willing to roll the dice a little bit. You know what you get from Will Redmond. And I think if, if you are forced to play somebody day one, between those two guys, they're taking Will Redmond over, over Vernon Scott because he knows the job, and he's done a good job. Um, in this situation, though, I think they're willing to roll the dice because they've got so many guys that they know can play. If one of them goes down, you take Raven Green, you put him back as just a safety safety to fill in for Adrian Amos or whoever it is that gets hurt. Um, but again, this is for who's going to be sitting on the bench in case of emergency. And, and again, I just think that they believe Vernon Scott can at least be coached up to play at the level of Will Redmond. And you don't want to give up potentially a very, very good football player in Vernon Scott simply because you're scared that what if an injury happens at some point you got to kind of say let's roll the dice and let's bet on the upside we're, we're obviously not going to get anything more from redmond that's what it is so so if i had to rank them not that it matters who the first two are but i'll say savage amos raven green vernon scott will redmond after that whatever the other amos deshaun amos i don't know it doesn't matter um and then again special teams is special teams so that's it that's where i'm at with uh, the roster currently as you know there's no training camp today hopefully we'll get a little bit of something tomorrow that we can talk about um please make sure you hit the subscribe button hit the like button hit the uh, notification bell all that good stuff also i want to encourage you to do a couple other things on top of the packernet podcast which is going live five days a week i may actually bump that up to seven days a week starting next week because we are having a new addition to the family, which means I'm going to be taking some time off, which means I'm going to have a lot of opportunities to do more content. So seven days a week for this and probably seven days a week for the YouTube channel. I'm, I'm planning on going hard. Um, so don't make, make, blah, 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 make sure you don't miss any of that stuff. And then also a couple other things, Packernet.com. It's a great place to get all your Packers news. It is a news aggregator. There's also a little gear icon so you can select which news sources you like. Save it. And there you go. You got your own little news thing. We got videos. We got audio. We got podcasts. We got everything you can want all in one place. Packernet.com. Finally, fan to fan Network. There's fan to fan Network.com. Get all the um, uh, news from around the NFL as well as some of the greatest um, Packers, or excuse me, the NFL influencers, whatever you want to call it. We've now got a YouTube channel, so check out FTFN on YouTube. Subscribe to that. they got some great content. Still working out some of the bugs, but we're going to be getting some regular content up there pretty quickly. Otherwise, I'll catch you next time. Mm -hmm.